quotes from probably a scientist that we all know, Stephen Hawking. Now, when we think about Stephen Hawking, we generally think about his work on black holes in the early universe, and the mathematics of, of cosmology. Uh, but as towards the end of his life, he spent more and more time thinking about this particular topic, hunting for aliens, the, in answering this question about whether we're alone in the universe. And so it's a, a nice quote from him saying that there's no bigger question in science than the search for extraterrestrial life. And he, he put his money where his mouth was in some sense. Uh, he, uh, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, Russian entrepreneur Yuri Milner put about 100 million pounds into something called the Breakthrough Program, Breakthrough Initiatives, the, the long-range goal, which is to get basically a snapshot of planets in the nearest star systems in Alpha and Proxima Centauri in the next 50 years or so. And along the way, there, there's various projects that they're funding to try to get us to that, to that stage where we send thousands of miniature little satellites, sort of you know, half-inch size satellites, thousands of them launched with giant solar sails and you know, terawatt lasers firing up through the atmosphere to accelerate these things to sort of the tenth of the speed of light or so. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very ambitious program. I'll touch on one or two of the, the goals a bit, a bit later on. Um, before I get into that, though, I'm going to say a few words about where I'm from. Can I have a show of hands for anyone who's been to Hull? No, it's about the same response I get when I ask this question, say, in London, for, even though it's only two hours away. Hull is a little outpost in the middle of almost nowhere. So I'll say something about that in, in just a second. But probably the most common question I get is this. Um, you sort of see the line underneath my name. I'm the, the director of the E.A. Milne Center for Astrophysics. So one of the things I do like to point out right away is that E.A. Milne is not the same person as A.A. A. Milne. Um, it's one, one, let, one letter difference, but it's an important difference. There are some interesting parallels in the sense that Alan Milne, the creator of Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robin, uh, was a decorated war hero in the Army in, 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 the, in the UK in the First World War. Uh, Arthur Milne, the namesake of the center uh, that I direct, uh, was, a, um, was also active in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he was, had strong ties to the military through the, the, primarily the Naval Reserve. He wanted to serve in the Navy but was unable to do, due to his health. We now know he had early onset Parkinson's, wasn't recognized at, at the time. But he served in the, Na the Naval Re Reserve in the South Coast, where he and a group of astrophysicists were seconded from Cambridge and Oxford to design the first um, anti-aircraft gunnery technology. World War I was effectively the first war fought in three dimensions, where you didn't have to just scan what was on the horizon. You had to worry about planes and zeppelins. And particularly in the south coast of England, you had fog and thick cloud. And so you had to try to optimize and uh, where to point your, your weapon if you wanted to bring down something. And it was, he designed the first techniques that are called echolocation, using his knowledge of stellar atmospheres. A lot of his work was based around trying to understand how energy got carried from the hearts of stars through the atmospheres of the stars. And so he applied that knowledge of, of atmospheric physics to the Earth's atmosphere and how sound propagates differently depending on altitude and barometric pressure and, and temperature and humidity and designed this echolocation technique. So if you look at his Wikipedia page, for example, there's a lot more about his contributions to the military than there is maybe about his uh, work in stellar atmospheres, as well as his work on uh, cosmology. He was a, a good friend of, of Einstein. Einstein used to visit him in, uh, uh, sort of in the, between the First and Second World War uh, in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, he, Arthur had his own alternate theory of, of cosmology. He didn't buy into Einstein's theories, thought they were too complicated. Um, he was very grounded in the, the real world, the classical world that we live in. He designed beautiful, elegant, mathematical uh, alternatives to Einstein's theories. Uh, they were wildly incorrect, but they were <laughs> beautiful and elegant maths, and uh, Einstein and he got along famously. Um, at the time that I moved to the University of Hull, it was four years ago, I'd been based for about 10 years on the west side of, of England in a city called Preston um, at the University of, of Central Lancashire. When I moved to Hull, one of the first things I, I did was 
just look through the Wikipedia page for Hull to see if there has been anyone famous who had come from Hull. Um, it's a very short entry in, in Wikipedia. There's not a whole lot of famous people who had come from Hull. But listed in amongst them was this name, Arthur Milne, that I rec remembered from you know, 25 years ago when I was an undergrad studying cosmology and some of these alternate theories of, of the early universe. And about the same time, um, his, uh, actually, come back to that one in, in just a second, his, uh, his daughter, uh, Meg, had just written a biography, which, I, in fact, why don't I just go straight to that and show you. Come back to that one in just a second. This is not cooperating now, so let's just come, I'm going to skip ahead one slide. I'll come back to that one in just a second. So um, Arthur's daughter, Meg, who is, this woman here uh, had written a biography about her father, and I got in touch with her. And through through her and through her granddaughter, we sort of established the the Milne Center in his name. Uh, it's a research center embedded within the the physics and mathematics department where I'm based. Um, we had the opening about four years ago, and that was about the last time I wore a tie as well. Uh, lurking at the back, not that you would know, there's a little head there which is about the size of a pixel for for you guys. That is one of the commanders of the Royal Navy who came up to uh, sort of in recognition of the contributions that Arthur had, had made uh, to the military. Uh, and it, apropos of nothing, this is my wife uh, who teaches um, first, year, uh, first year physics and maths to primarily our international students. We have a significant cohort of students that come from uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, primarily from sort of the, the Middle East countries. And so that's one of her jobs is to, um, for those who didn't score well on their English scores and couldn't go directly into physics and maths and engineering, uh, she teaches, there's about 120 students who come through that route. Um, and it has nothing more to do with the talk that I'm, I'm actually going to be <laughs> saying, but uh, I'm punching well above my weight there. Okay, so one of the, the common questions I get is where is the University of Hull? And what is the University of Hull? Most of you will have heard of Manchester and Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, the university is one of the oldest in the UK. Uh, I think there's about 160 universities. It's sort of 12th or 13th. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. Until I moved there, I didn't know anything about it because there wasn't any astronomy or astrophysics, so I hadn't had any reason to actually go and, and visit. Uh, it has a surprisingly rich scientific history. I mentioned Arthur Milne. Uh, we've heard some talk about tides. Ernest Brown was a famous astronomer in the first half, uh, towards the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, who developed a lot of sort of the um, a lot of the lunar theory that we now have about tides and making tidal predictions. And John Venn, if you if you've ever heard of a Venn diagram where you put little circles overlapping, uh, that uh, when you walk onto campus, that's the first thing you th see is the Venn building. Uh, we don't have really a liquid crystal display here, uh, but if there was, that technology was invented at the University of Hull in the 60s at a time when the university didn't know anything about uh, patents, and they lost out on potentially billions of pounds probably if they had, uh, had been clever and filed the patent. Technology that's used, if you've got a Samsung phone, for example, the technology that's used in there, that is a direct descendant of the technology that George Gray uh, developed. Apple's gone a slightly different route. Um, as I said, the center, we established it four years ago. Um, there's now about 30 staff and PhD students. Uh, we've got, we're fairly big into high-performance computing. We're just um, in the midst of purchasing a new facility with about 20,000 cores. And I'll show you some examples towards the end of what we're using that facility for. And the, the city was the, uh, the UK city of culture. So it's, even though it's kind of a, a rough northern city with primarily a strong maritime history, I guess, uh, it's actually quite a beautiful city uh, that sits on the east coast, beautiful beaches all around there. So if you're ever in the area, it's tempting to bypass it. I mentioned that it was kind of isolated. It's the only city in the country that doesn't have a motorway. So you can, as you're driving from Manchester and Leeds towards Hull, the motorway just stops about seven or eight miles away from Hull, and you get onto sort of a single lane road that takes you into the city. Um, it's, a, it's a very peculiar sort of isolated little area. It's also, and I'll come back to it in a second, it's the poorest city, and you've got to pay attention to that one. Uh, it's also the poorest city in the country, so in terms of household income, 
it, it does have the, the lowest household income of all the cities in, in the UK. And it's one of the reasons why I chose to move my group from Preston to, to Hull, was trying to be a, working in a university that's an anchor institute in a region where aspirations are fairly low. And so I will say a little bit about that before I get into the, into the talk itself. Um, we do have some traditional, if you like, observers who look through telescopes. Uh, although the vast majority of us are, our science is based around making use of high performance computing facilities and trying to sort of tease out the physics that underpins some of the beautiful things that you guys are much better at taking picture of than, than we are. Um, I worked closely in the past with, again, this, you recognize this fellow here, Stephen Hawking. Um, Stephen and I have a grant with the UK government that funds the National Cosmology Supercomputer called Cosmos. And so not only do we have a, we have a nice facility on campus, but through the, the link that Stephen and I have, we maintain a 20% a share of that facility. So it's allowed us to do some pretty spectacular things. And again, right towards the end, I'll show you some of the, sort of the science things that we are working on now and how it links into the sort of scientific theme of, of the evening. And as Dean has said, um, a big part of what we do is based around outreach and engagement. Uh, I'm not naive. The university didn't invest in so astrophysics because they have some deep passion for astronomy and astrophysics. It's because they, they see astronomy, as many of you do, as, as a way to, to reach sort of the next generation of science, technology, engineering, and math students, the STEM, the STEM students. And I'm happy to see that there's a few in the room here right now. Um, you know, it's, it's space and dinosaurs. That's how you reach kids, broadly speaking. And so it's part of our remit is to, is to make strong links uh, around the region and sort of expand where we can across the country. And we do that through various programs, whether it's uh, we have formal agreements with 30 or 40 uh, regional schools and colleges. Um, uh, we do uh, roughly about 100 school visits per year from three and four year olds at what we call reception or, or nursery uh, through to sort of years 12 and 13, what, what we call colleges in, in, in the UK. And we make use of things like mobile planetariums. These are a number of my students who sort of run the planetarium for me. Uh, so at every science festival around the region, engineering fairs, uh, public events, uh, we make use of, of that. And I've got a, an incredibly energetic uh, group of students who support what I'm doing, particularly sort of Leah and Beth and, and Rosie over here. Uh, I've also been fortunate that I've got some partners who are helping grow this in this region of the country. Some of them are names you may recognize. Uh, people, Martin Rees is a, sort of a, a contemporary of, of, of Stephen Hawking and has uh, worked, did incredibly pioneering work in supermassive black holes and active galactic nuclei. He's also the, the Queen's astronomer. You may not realize the Queen has you know, basically a bat phone she can pick up to call the Astronomer Royal for England. And that is Martin Rees. Now, it is obviously more of an honorary role. I don't think the Queen wakes up in the middle of the night and actually calls Martin and asks for his advice on things. But technically, there is an Astronomer Royal. Uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the discoverer of pulsars, and Helen Sharman, who's the, the UK's first astronaut. And she was born just down the road from from Hull, and so she's worked very closely with us, uh, visiting schools and colleges. Uh, here's, here's Helen. Uh, this is my daughter, Esme, uh, holding Princess Sophia, which is never out of her hand. Uh, <laughs> and this Helen was up last year when we hosted the British Science Festival. And so uh, Helen and, and Jocelyn, they come up twice a year. Uh, they come with me into schools, uh, primarily primary schools, and anywhere from that three, four, up to uh, 12 year old or so, um, talking about their experiences, not only as sort of women in STEM subjects, but their, um, in the case of Helen, talking about her work as an astronaut and, and how she liaises with the, uh, the Russian cosmonaut program as the first UK astronaut to, to go up. And again, these are some of my students who help out with uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing and trying to raise the number of women entering uh, the STEM subjects. I'll s say something about that in a second. Oh, I forgot, yeah, we've, uh, just a few weeks ago, we welcomed Michael Fole, who's one of the most decorated astronauts in the world. Uh, he's also born not far from Hull. Uh, he lives in Houston now. I think he's one of only a handful of astronauts who've spent more than a year in space. Uh, so Michael has now joined the team 
and it's, again spends a couple of weeks per year with us visiting schools and colleges and, and engaging with, with kids with me. Uh, and as, as Dina said, uh, one of the, the issues that we face in the STEM subjects, particularly at that end of the spectrum where physics, maths, computer science sit, is that there are, you, you know, if you go back to say 11 and 12 year old, 11 and 12 year olds, equal numbers of boys and girls are interested in the STEM subjects. At each step along the way as you progress say through um, junior high and high, high school here, you lose more and more girls as you, as you progress. Uh, the other end of the STEM spectrum, say biology, zoology, psychology, actually flip the other way around. If you go to an undergraduate, first year undergraduate class in psychology, you'll see it flip the other way around. It'll be 80% women, 20% men. In physics, it's flipped the other way around. And this is not a new problem. It's not unique to the UK. It's the same here as it is more or less, not everywhere in the world, uh, but more or less everywhere in the world uh, and we have faced the, the issue has been even more acute because, again, this is one of the poorest areas of the country and just engaging with anyone to actually go in and, and take up the STEM subjects is challenging. Uh, the University of Hull, look back over the past tech decade, the first year cohort has been, it fluctuated between 10 to 14 uh, percent were, were women. Uh, I've been lucky over the last couple of years that I've, by the links that we've made with regional schools and colleges, we offer 40 or 50 work experience, summer internship uh, during Easter break, Christmas break, um, or half term breaks as they call them. Uh, we bring in four or five students, but three quarters I guess have been, have been women in that sort of 15 to 18 year old range. Um, they work with us on sort of intensive research projects. They are given a an important component of something that will turn into a paper. They're co-authors on our papers. They're entrusted with a high degree of responsibility. They're not shadowing us in what we do in terms of work experience. So we've designed small nuggets of research that fits into several days or a week or two weeks or if they're there for some chunk of the summer. It can be something more ambitious. Um, and I think through them I've been able to secure students like these uh, who have sort of picked up the mantle and now when I go to schools and colleges usually one or two come along with me. They talk to students about what their experiences were like coming from uh, fairly uh, disadvantaged, let's say, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and they've, they've changed the way that our university, and particularly the STEM subject, are viewed. So for physics and maths, as Dina was saying, we've actually gone from Last year we were, two years ago, well, three years ago we were at 10%, and we're at 25%, uh, we're up to 30% now. So it's coming from a very low base. Our most recent round of open day, we're up to 40% women who are visiting for physics and maths. And I'd like to take credit for it, but it's mostly been a cohort like this and some of the other students have really helped out. Now, one of the comments that people look at when they see this is that gender diversity, but it's a very white looking crowd. That reflects in large part the, the demographics of where we live. Hull is not only the poorest city in the country, it's also the whitest city in the country. It's 96% white. It is, um, it's not all white English. There is a large population, uh, strong Eastern European connections. So three of the five there are from um, Bulgaria, Latvia, and uh, Russia. And, but these guys have, have been absolutely incredible in terms of attracting more women into the STEM subjects, particularly in that end of the spectrum where we do not normally recruit women. This was just a f first step. We are certainly trying now to move beyond sort of just sort of the simple binarity and looking at uh, non-binarity and, and diversity, looking at building our uh, trying to expand our reach into regions where we can reach other uh, breakdowns or the racial barriers, the ongoing battle against the socioeconomic barriers. And it's you know, not a simple thing to fix or it would have been fixed everywhere in the world, but uh, we are slowly getting there. And we did get a, this sort of bronze award from the UK government for sort of best practice in, in the country. Um, yeah, and I, well, I already said, but part of the way we do this is through in internships and work experience. We do it, like I said, a little bit differently than other places do in the UK, in that for the most part when they bring, say, 15, 16, 17 year olds in, they sort of shadow you. 
and see what you're doing. Um, but like I say, we have ring-fenced areas of research that allow them to contribute to a published paper and they're entrusted with a degree of responsibility to make sure they get it right. And I think treating them with that sort of responsibility uh, has made a big impact on, in terms of our recruitment numbers. Okay, that was sort of the, the background. Now for the next sort of 30 minutes, what I want to say is probably what you actually came to hear, which is trying to answer this question. Now I'd like to say that you're going to walk away with an answer. Um, I'm not going to be able to say that though. Um, you, I guess the first thing I might do is put your hand up if you think the answer to this question is yes, that there is nothing out there. We are alone. Who, yeah, I guess that's another way to put it. Who thinks we are alone in the universe? There's just one, two, three, maybe four, yeah, something, something like that. So that's typically the numbers I get at an astronomical society. It's that um, maybe 5% or so will, will put their hands up. If I think if you ask the general, general public, I think CNN, BBC have done these surveys, and you get something like maybe two-thirds think there's something out there and one-third thinks there isn't. I guess for those who think there is something out there, how many of you think that there is something that is, I don't know, let's call it intelligence, something that you could communicate with, an advanced civilization? I, we can debate a bit later about what that actually means, but just broadly speaking, something that is some in, alien intelligence that you may be able to communicate with. So hands up. Okay. And who thinks if there's anything out there, it's just some microbial life or bacteria or something, and that's it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, some of it is dependent on your question. If, it, if you can yeah. communicate with it, is that counting practicality? Or is yeah. That so, uh, yeah, these are all really good questions, and let's spend the next half hour touching on a few of these things along the way. Um, now, along with one of the first questions being, why did you name the center after the guy who created Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> one of the, the other questions I get is, well, clearly, We've already been visited before. I know that because I've seen it on, you know, read it in a sort of a tablet, you know, the equivalent of the National Enquirer or something. <laughs> so I think there is this real passion, this desire to believe there is something out there. And you could spend hours stepping through the, well, I wouldn't call it evidence, but let's put quotes around evidence that there has been something out there before. Now, I'm just going to step you through a few of the things that have been put forward to suggest that there is something out there. Some of them are a little bit more legitimate than others. Uh, this is one of the ones that got a lot of attention, I guess it was in 1996 or so. Uh, this is a, a meteorite. It's not just any bog standard meteorite. This is an interesting one. You can actually go to the, um, the Smithsonian if you want to see what's left of it. Little bits have been chunked off and put on, chopped off and, and put under microscopes to look at. This is a, a meteorite that came from the surface of Mars. It formed probably about four billion years ago when there was probably still some water on the surface. Um, it was probably blasted off of the surface, best guess is around 15 million years ago. Something impacted on the surface of Mars, threw stuff up into the atmosphere, and this chunk was going fast enough that it got out of the gravitational pull of Mars. And then it spent 15 million years slowly working its way around the solar system. And then best guess is about 15,000 years ago, it landed on the Antarctic Plateau. And then it was discovered sort of 30-odd years or so uh, ago in the Antarctic. And when they sliced off little bits, put it under a microscope, they saw things that looked like this. And so they got an enormous amount of attention. You know, the, the scale here is, we say, say, nanometers. So if you took a billion of them and lined them up, then you'd have something that was about this big. So it's, these are really, really tiny little things, but they kind of look like fossilized bacteria, nanobacteria. That's what it looks like kind of to the eye. It doesn't, you could sort of look at that and convince yourself, yeah, I'm looking at some sort of fossil of some sort of life that existed on Mars in the distant past. And it got a lot of attention. Uh, Bill Clinton had a press conference uh, in front of the White House in the garden talking about the fact that you know, this changes our, our viewpoint of the universe because now we know we're not alone. And you, know, you can see the headline on, on our equivalent of the National Enquirer, Life from Mars. 
Now, there were a handful of geologists at the time who were sort of waving their hands saying, you know, wait, hold on a second. There are things on Earth that actually look like this that have nothing to do with a biological origin. There are abiological things that look like this. And you can take something like this. Now, when I show this to kids in schools, they go, oh, gross, because it looks like worms. It's not. It's a, this sodium calcium silica crystal. Sometimes it's called vermicular. But if you zoom in close enough, even on things that look like crystalline structures, this has nothing to do with life. This is just a, a zoomed-in picture of something. So just because something has the shape, or we call it the morphology of something that looks like a fossil, doesn't necessarily make it a fossil. Now, there are still a handful of people who say, yeah, but you, know, you don't know for sure that this is a non-biological origin. But there is a lot of work that's been done over the last 25 years, 20 years or so, that have said, you know, if, if you believe in Occam's razor, the most likely explanation is you're looking at an abiological, non-biological origin for these little things. Now, of course, there's other things that look more like there's aliens out there. If you wander around the surface of Mars, there's all kinds of things on Mars that look like there are aliens. You've got uh, this woman, uh, mermaid, people have said, sitting on the ridge, resting her arm on her shoulder, on her, on her knee. Uh, you've got frogs sitting there. You've got things like floating spoons. Uh, you've got iguanas. You've got rats. You've got bowler hats. There's all kinds of things that look like they had something to do with life. Now, there's no scale on there. Most of the things you're looking at are little rocks that are sort of this big. Uh, but every time something, you know, if you wander through the database that NASA has, Curiosity, the various rovers, you know, if you look at millions and millions of pictures of, of rocks or millions of pictures of clouds, you're going to see things that look like something else. It's a psychological effect called pareidolia. If you look at this rock from a different angle, it's not going to look like that. There's also rock features on Earth like this as well. You can just Google pareidolia rock features on Earth. People have wandered through the Sahara taking pictures of things that look like hedgehogs and porcupines and all kinds of things. So this is probably not life. And these things, if they are life, they don't move because you go back and take a picture sometimes later. Uh, they're still sitting in exactly the same place that they were before. So probably not aliens. But every time something interesting comes up, some press release comes out suggesting that you know, there's something sitting there on Mars. This is a more interesting one. This is the wow signal from about 40 years ago, 1977. Uh, this is a, a, a Ohio State, um, I think it was Big Ear Observatory, that was conducting one of the early SETI searches, searches for extraterrestrial intelligence using radio telescope, sort of scanning the sky at a frequency 1420 megahertz, 1 1.4 gigahertz. That is the frequency that Hydrogen, neutral hydrogen. Hydrogen is the proton and an electron, and the electron flips up and down spontaneously. Every time it does that, it gives off a wavelength of light, which is about 21 centimeters in, in wavelength. This neutral hydrogen is sort of everywhere around us. Uh, it is the most, by far, the most common element in the universe. So most of the SETI searches that have been done to date have worked at, have tried to think a little bit like an alien, let's say. If an alien wanted to communicate, what would be the easiest way to communicate? Well, you would probably not choose an extremely obscure chemical element or isotope to carry your message on. You would use the most common thing in the universe. And it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, hydrogen is the most common thing. So that is the, the logic behind most of these searches. You know, 91% of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen. So if you wanted to send a message, if you like, the thinking is, you would somehow piggyback on the most common element and the most common transition, the most common wavelength that hydrogen emits at is this 21 centimeter line. So that's why most of these searches work at that wavelength. The astronomers who were doing this survey woke up the next day on one of these days. And this was before you had digital collection. You just had reams and reams of paper and looked at all these letters and numbers and saw something that they hadn't seen before. Now, the letters and the numbers don't really mean a whole lot, but what it is was just a two-minute long intense blast of radio emission at this frequency in a very narrow channel, what we call 10 kilohertz for those who are AM radio fans. It's about the, the space of an AM radio, but 10 kilohertz station. Um, and they looked at it and they said, look, there is nothing inside of our electronics that could, be, that could actually drive this sort of noise for two minutes. Uh, 
they spent a lot of time trying to eliminate all the potential things, and at the end of the day concluded, look, we can't think of anything electronic that is responsible. So that's why it's got the big wow on it. There's a gigantic Wikipedia page that takes you through the history of this little signal. Uh, it's been that part of the sky was looking towards Sagittarius and glo globular cluster, I think it's M55. It's been surveyed over and over and over and over and over, and over again. The signal has never been seen again. Uh, there is, it probably was something in the electronics that they can't track down. It possibly could have been some ground-based signal that reflects off of something, you know, a chunk of metal in the atmosphere and happened to come back down into the feed horn again. It could have been potentially, some people suggested, a comet that was passing through the, the feed horn of the telescope. Don't know. Um, if you want to believe that it's an alien signal that was a one-off and never heard again, it's hard to dismiss it, but it probably is something more like electronics. Until you get a re repeated signal, this is the general philosophy of all the SETI searches, unless something is, can be repeated, you have to take it with a big grain of salt. And just the, the last couple of other ones that are interesting. Um, this is from the Kepler mission. You've probably heard of, sometimes referred to as Tabby star or Boyajian star. Uh, Kepler is a satellite that was studying, you know, postage stamp size region of the sky, night after night after night after night after night, taking pictures and looking at what called light curves. Many, 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 many stars. Most stars, night after night, you know, they're the same brightness, night after night after night after night after night. Some of them, you know, are variable stars that do little things, uh, Cepheids and Ar Lyrae. Um, this one is different than every other star that we know of in the universe, trillions of them. It is the only star that instead of doing little, little things like, well, it's probably hard to see, but you can see a little planet going in front. The whole point of the Kepler mission was to look for transiting planets that go in front of the star. So the light dips by one or two percent, and then you know, a year later it might do it again, and then again. And this is how we've discovered the vast majority of the extrasolar planets that we know about. What this particular star did though, you know, is it was sort of going along like this, and then half the light disappeared, and then it came back and then 20% disappeared, and then it came back up, and it was sort of go going like this, unlike every other star, which never does more than a few percent. And so again, it got a lot of attention. Um, some people, include, uh, again, one of our National Enquirer equivalents is the, the Daily Mail. Uh, so the Daily Mail suggests that what you're looking at is this. It's not, nothing to do with astrophysics. You're seeing what is called a partially constructed Dyson sphere. Now a Dyson sphere, just think of it as solar panels. You just wrap a, a gigantic set of solar mirror, uh, panels all around the star with very advanced batteries to absorb all of the energy. And then whenever you need some energy, you just go off and bleed some from the, the, from the batteries. And what you were seeing was something that was partially constructed. So as this thing is moving, you know, it blocks off half of the light or you might get an opening and might get most of the light coming through. It's, it was an interesting theory. Um, probably wasn't right. Uh, you're probably looking at something more like, and we'll come back to this uh, over the last sort of 20 minutes, is possibly thousands, hundreds, thousands of comets coming raining down into the inner part of the solar system, blocking off large chunks of the light in sort of a random sense. You could also be looking at a gigantic dust ring that's tilted and kind of off-centered as it goes around, partially blocking the light. But it's something like that which is obscuring the star, and we happen to have caught it at a unique moment in time where a large chunk of it is being obscured, either by comets or by some tilted dust ring, rather than a partially constructed Dyson sphere. And I, I won't belabor all of these. There's any number of these things that you can look at. Um, if you, you know, my parents, I can remember when I was young looking on the bookshelf and seeing things like Chariots of the Gods from Eric Van Dyneken, who had all kinds of theories about the pyramids and you know, the Nazca, Nazca Plains, um, stuff about crop circles, which uh, you know, living in, in the UK, what you learn very quickly is that all, if, when aliens do visit and put down crop circles, they always come to the UK. Almost <laughs> every one of these crop circles are in the UK. Uh, they also seem to know exactly where the major roads are because they're always just a little bit offset from the roads <laughs> rather than out in the middle of the field. Uh, you get people like Spirit Airlines here in the U.S. now use crop circles as advertising. It was pretty good. Um, this is an interesting one. This is an iron pillar, about five meters tall in, in Delhi, in India. 
again, Van Dyneken in his Chariots of the Gods said that this was evidence of aliens because this iron pillar doesn't rust. It was you know, constructed 1,600 years ago and said there's no way the technology could have existed given the humidity in Delhi that it had to have been aliens. Now, of course, that was just an insult to the, uh, how advanced the Indian ironsmiths were. Uh, they, were, they knew full well that if you didn't want iron to rust, you needed to infuse it or coat it in, basically it's a phosphorus rich layer, if you like, that is wrapped around it. And there's evidence of this all across India now. And you get things like this cool little video up here from about 10 years ago, uh, got a lot of attention when it first came out. Uh, this was just a, a kid in his garage with uh, you know, the equivalent of a blender software package who, if you look carefully, the tree there is the same as the tree there is the same as the tree there. He just took one tree and composited it and uh, it was very clever. And threw it up on YouTube, got zillions of hits. He now works at a special effects firm in Paris doing software. <laughs> that was uh, pretty good. So, all of these I put up just to show that you know, we really do want to believe. Now we can dismiss the vast majority of those things, but it just is, it's just evidence to, sh to show that the general public, people in this room, myself, we want to believe that there is something out there, that we're not alone in the universe. So are we alone? Well, let's take a step back and talk a little bit of astrophysics in the remainder of the talk. So if I could play God for a second and step out of the galaxy and look down on the Milky Way, this is what it would look like. You're looking at roughly about 100 billion stars. And if you turned it sideways, it'd be a nice little thin disk. But these 100 billion stars are all moving in this plane um, in a clockwise sense. And they're all moving at roughly half a million miles an hour. And it doesn't matter whether you're sitting out here, you move at half a million miles an hour. If you're sitting down here, you move at half a million miles an hour. Yeah, plus or minus some. We, around those... 100 billion stars, you know, you've got you know, billions, tens of billions of potentially interesting, potentially habitable planets, rocky planets. We'll come back to that in just a second. The sun itself sits sort of in the suburbs, halfway out. Uh, we're also moving at roughly half a million miles an hour, and we lie between two spiral arms that are where most of the action in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy occurs. We sit in this region when there's not a whole lot around us. It's an under-dense region. The spiral arms are maybe five to ten times more dense. That's where the gas, the dust, the things that actually turn into stars. Most of the star formation in our galaxy is aligned with those spiral arms as well. Now the spiral arms are also moving at where we sit, are also moving at about half a million miles an hour. So we more or less spend a large chunk of time moving through a very under-dense region where not a whole lot happens. That's not the case for the stars out here or in there, where the spiral arms are moving at a different speed than the stars. So the stars run into the spiral arms much more regularly as you move away from our region here, something called co-rotation. So that's just to give you the, the landscape. And it's not surprising if you go to a nice dark site and you look up, you know, it's not surprising the, the majority of us kept our hands down thinking that there must be something out there once you see sort of that well, that's not good. The, the, when you see just under the, the night sky just how spectacular it looks to the eye, it's not surprising that the majority of us think there must be something out there. You can also just look at things like you know, top 20 grossing films of all time, something like 13 or 14 of them are based around the existence of aliens. We do want to believe that there is something out there. Um, in that particular picture, if you were paying attention, you saw the Milky Way happily sort of going, cutting across the middle of the screen. Off to the side, you would have seen two blobs. Now, I am primarily a theoretician. I use supercomputers to do simulations of things like the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but when I finished my PhD, I went to Australia for a few years to, uh, to learn how to be an observational astronomer. And I didn't do a whole lot of observational astronomy, but my, one of my very first observing runs was with a, a well-known astronomer uh, who I wanted to learn from. And one of my jobs was to stand out on the pier of the telescope, walk around the dome, report back to, to Gary every once in a while whether there was clouds rolling in or not, whether it was, the conditions were photometric. 
And you know, it was a nice clear night, and now it's still photometric, still photometric. Then at some point I went and said, look, Gary, I think clouds are, are starting to roll in, and I don't think the conditions are photometric any longer. And he said, look, I can't see anything in here that suggests that. And he came out with me and stood on the pier and looked around, and I was pointing out these clouds in the sky. What I didn't, of course, Gary said, you know, slapped me in the back of the head and said, that's the large and the small Magellanic clouds. Those are galaxies. They're not. And so I was never invited back on an optical observing run ever again after that. And that's probably all for the good. So um, since we're talking about life and whether we're alone, let's boil it down to a very simple equation. And you can use a cooking analogy. Life is based around having ingredients, the building blocks. Uh, you need an oven to take those ingredients and cook them in, and you need to cook for sufficient time for life to form. If you think of life on Earth, for example, it didn't spontaneously appear. It took about a billion years for the first life to appear. It took a couple billion years for multicellular life. It took, you know, it's only 200 million years ago that um, mammals appeared, and only a couple hundred thousand years since Homo sapiens appeared. So you need some sort of cooking time. Base, I know it's a sample of one, uh, but there's some time for things, for planets to settle down, for the conditions to be right, to bring life together. But we're gonna, I'm just going to step you through each of these terms of the equation very quickly. And first, just look at the, what are the ingredients. So here we're talking about complex life. So we, again, it's, there's this, Carl Sagan called it carbon chauvinism. And there is something to it, because again, it's a sample of one. But life here on Earth is based around carbon. And there's a number of reasons why, if you step away from sort of the, the chauvinism aspect to it, there are a number of reasons why you might believe that carbon actually is an important fundamental component of life. And rather than, say, silicon. Uh, if you follow Star Trek, you know, the, I first encountered silicon life forms in the Devil in the Dark episode. Now, carbon has some, you know, fantastic properties. If you want complex life, you need complex molecules. You can't just, it's, it's hard to envision how you would construct life out of individual elements. You need complexity. Carbon is unique quite unique, let's say, amongst the chemical elements, and that it loves to bond with all kinds of things that we think of as being important to life. You can make beautiful, complex organic molecules, long, beautiful chains. It loves to bond with hydrogen and nitrogen and ox oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur, all the things that we associate with, with life. Silicon doesn't. Silicon doesn't like to bond to things, and when it does, it turns into sort of a crystalline structure rather than what we think of as, as complex organic molecules. There are some other elements that might be um, potential building blocks for some, something. You know, germanium has been put forward by others. But carbon, first off, is you know, a million times more common than germanium, for example. It's the fourth most common element <coughs> in the universe. Um, and even if you look at something like Earth, even though there's 10 times more silicon than there is carbon in the mantle of the Earth, uh, you know, we are still a carbon-based life form. We're not a silicon-based life form. Carbon is a beautiful element for constructing complex life because of the way it bonds together with things. We also have a, a very finely balanced uh, number of, of carbon atoms. So if you look at, a, say, in our solar system, for every five atoms of carbon, you get nine atoms of oxygen. If it had been flipped the other way around, in an average statistical sense, the planets would not have the rich mineralogical structure that they have here in our solar system. They would look like the lead of a pencil. They would just be sort of a gra ball of graphite. That's, again, a broad, it's a statistical argument, not one that you'd look at on an individual planet-by-planet um, you know, -planet basis. So we think that carbon, and even, even Carl Sagan, as he went along in time, he sort of moved away from the carbon chauvinism picture and said, yeah, no, there, there actually are some real important reasons why we would think complex life would use carbon as its fundamental base. We also think that water is probably important. Uh, and again, you think of it as show, water chauvinism, if you like, there might be other liquids. But water, again, is a great medium in the sense that it's a fantastic solvent. You can dissolve anything in water. It may take some time. Toss a bar of iron in, it'll eventually dissolve. You can toss a human body in, it will dissolve. 
If you are a single cell that you know, wants to grow, water is a great way to extract energy from the environment. And it's also a great medium to carry away waste material because it doesn't matter whether it's me or you or a single cell, there's waste coming out of us. And water is a great, great way to carry that out through the cell. So yes, you can possibly do it with methane. Yes, you can possibly do it with some other ones, but water is fantastic for this. You, over a quite a broad range of temperature, you can have solid, liquid, and gas all in the, simultaneously together. It also is magical in the sense that when you freeze it, it freezes from the top. You, know, you toss an ice cube into a glass of water, it floats. This is not the case with other liquids. When you freeze them, they sort of freeze everywhere at once. If you are life that's starting to develop, and water is an important part of that development, particularly if you're having you know, climactic changes where things are freezing, Great, if the surface freezes, you still have all of the liquid underneath. You can, if you're a life that's nascent life that's trying to start developing, you still have everything that you need in terms of the building blocks for life, even if you do go through an extended period of being frozen. So again, that's an, these are sort of almost objective ways that we think water could play and should and possibly has to play an important role. So it's not just the ingredients. You need to have a, a, an, an oven uh, to actually cook these ingredients. Um, if you believe that water is important, then we have this thing called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. So a star like the sun, this blue area, you know, that we have one planet that sits in the zone where liquid water can exist on the surface. Mars is just outside, Venus is just inside. Probably in the distant past, four billion years ago, Mars was probably, probably just inside that habitable zone. But we've got roughly one planet, well, roughly, we have one planet that sits in the habitable zone. Uh, right now. If you go to a smaller star, which are much more common, they're cooler, so the habitable zone is much closer. You need to get closer to have, allow your surface temperature to be right for liquid water to exist. Bigger stars are hotter, the habitable zone can be further away. Problem with the bigger stars, they live fast and they die young. By the time you even get the two stars that weigh two or three times the mass of the sun, they're gone quite quickly before life, as we know it, would probably have a, the time to develop in a complex sense. These low mass ones are more common, but the problem is the closer you get to them, the more you have to start worrying about things that we just heard about, coronal mass ejections, flares, um, eruptions. You have to be so close that you need to almost be butted up against the surface of the thing. So you're getting blasted by radiation and high energy cosmic rays from these, these very active low mass stars. So there is thought that there's this sweet spot in, in sort of in this range in here where the conditions are right. The stars live long enough and they're not so active that you have to be butted up right against the star to have the right temperature. The other thing that we think is important is probably a magnetic field. We take it for granted. We've heard talk about the aurora borealis and aurora australis. We provide you with these beautiful uh, pictures. Um, but in a more practical sense, the particles that are responsible for these great colors are also the same particles that were probably responsible for evaporating Mars's atmosphere because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. We have this beautiful magnetic field that acts as a sheath that protects us. So we don't get blasted by the same intense radiation, the intense cosmic rays, high energy cosmic rays that not only can damage your atmosphere, but can also, you know, if you are the very beginnings of DNA and RNA and you're getting blasted with high energy cosmic rays, they're very fragile. If your life that's developing on the surface, it's very easy to break it apart because of these sorts of uh, eruptive events. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. Oddly enough, Mercury does. Uh, NASA has, there's the InSight mission, which is at Mars now, trying to partially try to understand why it is that Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. But we're fortunate, we've got that magnetic field. We've got a nice molten core, which allows the turbulence inside the goo in the center of the Earth to keep that magnetic field strong and protect us. And we also, uh, the other thing that we sort of take for granted is the moon. Now our moon is so bizarre compared to every other moon in our solar system, it's incredible. Now there are moons that are bigger. I think our moon is maybe the fourth biggest or something of the 200 moons that we have cataloged. But what is really unique is that when you look at how big it is compared to the planet that it's around. So it's roughly one one hundredth. If you took 100 moons, that would weigh how much? the Earth weighs. But if you look at any other of the 199 moons that we know about, it, instead of, it, they're a factor of sort of 10,000 lower in terms of the ratio. So Titan is bigger, but of course it's going around a really big planet. What that means is 
there's something very unique about the Earth uh, amongst the planets in our solar system. And beyond just sort of a random unique fact, it actually plays an important role. It stabilizes the Earth. You know, we're tilted at this 23 degrees, the obliquity. The reason why it stays at 23 degrees and gives us reasonably long-term climate stability is because we have this big, heavy moon that keeps it at exactly 23 degrees as it's going around the sun. You take away the moon, you go forward in time a few billion years when the, sun is, uh, the moon is drifted out a factor of three, and then it becomes more like a bowling ball rolling around. Not sort of that fast, of course, as it's going around, but you do get wild climactic changes when you take away the stabilizing influence. So there's something very rare about our moon, and it, we think that it plays an important part, although this is still being debated as to exactly how important it is. The other thing, if you're thinking about life, and you want, and you want life to be common, uh, what you don't want to have is a solar system where everything that we know about it is rare. What you'd like to think is our solar system, our planet, is there's nothing special about it. What, if, well, you really, again, what you really don't want is something that your solar system is wildly unique compared to all the other solar systems. Now, there is a, this, is, this is ongoing work, and there's you know, people here in Colorado who are working on this, amongst other places, looking at extrasolar planets. We know about 4,000, 4,500 of them nowadays. Over the next decade, that will go up by a factor of 10 or more. So there's a large amount of information that is out there on extrasolar planets. One thing that we do know about, now this is our solar system, it's not to scale, obviously. The, um, but what we do know about is that when you look at the thousands of planets that are out there, outside of our own, basically they come in two masses. They're either, broadly, three times the mass of the Earth, or they're the mass of Jupiter. So if you look at it in, the exact numbers don't really matter, but this is what we call a log plot. But the main point is, here's the masses of all of the planets that we know about. It's not random. They pile up around the mass of, this is where Jupiter sits. And this is roughly three times the mass of the Earth. Now, there's obviously a bit of spread there. But there, there's not a random distribution. Now, some of this could be due to the, what we call selection effects of the Kepler mission and others who have built these things. This will become clearer as NASA's test mission goes along over the next decade or so. But what you see is that our planet, we don't have any what we call super-Earths. Again, it's small numbers, so there's only eight planets there, but we've got nothing that sits in the most, that most common mass range that extrasolar planets sit. So there's something, you know, it's, again, it's a, it's a very small sample, and you don't want to make too much out of it, but this is something that is being talked about right now. Why, why does it appear that the distribution of masses in our solar system are different than what we see in other solar systems? Another thing that you can look at is that what we know about extrasolar planets, these 4,000 or so that we know about, the vast majority of them sit about this far from their star. They are, they are literally butted up right against their planets. So again, if you looked at a, call it a histogram, there's where, these are all the extrasolar planets we know about. Here's where Jupiter sits. Here's where Mercury sits. The vast majority of them, and this is, again, a log scale. So they are really rammed up close. But some of this, probably all of it, but it's still being debated. How much of that is the selection effects? So it's much easier if you've got a big super Jupiter, and I'm sure you guys have had talks about these, these hot Jupiters, these big giant Jupiters that are really close to their star, and they go around really fast. Those are really easy to see because you take a light curve with Kepler and you know, every few weeks or months or whatever, you'll see this big dip. They're easy to find. That, this is what I mean by a selection effect. What we want to know and we will know over the next few years is how much of these sorts of things are selection effects. If you took the data as they stand right now, you would look at that and say there is something different about our solar system. I suspect some of this, maybe all of it will disappear there are a lot cleverer people than I looking at exactly this right now. But it's just something to bear in mind as to where we stand right now today. Just be careful about interpreting the, the conclusions that are made. But at least as the data stands right now, it's just something to, you know, to keep an eye on. Now, the, sort of the, the last thing I just want to say about uh, our galaxy. When you step out again and look down on it, <clears throat> we've... If you, if you took everything I've said at face value, going from 100 billion stars 
Maybe 10% of them are the, the right sort of star with the right mass. Maybe 10% of the um, have a, a rocky mass uh, planet in the habitable zone. Maybe 10% have a magnetic field, maybe. Uh, maybe 10% have a moon that is a stabilizing influence. You go from hundreds of billions of stars down to maybe tens of millions of potential planets. That's still a big number, but it, you sort of reduce things by several orders of magnitude as you, as you go along. But on top of all of that, you have to worry about what these spiral arms are going to do to you. Now, there are two effects here that I just want to say. One is this one. This is a, an aerial swing. It goes around in a nice circle whenever the, the weather is nice and there's no strong gusts of wind. Nice and symmetric. If you get a, a little gust of wind, that symmetry can get broken. If you get a really strong gust of wind, then the cards can sort of collide together. This happened in, a couple of years ago in Cardiff in the UK at their winter wonderland. Nobody was hurt, but uh, it's the sort of effect that you get when you get a short, sharp gust of wind that breaks the symmetry. Now, this does not happen. We don't have winds like this when we talk about stars moving around through the Milky Way galaxy. But what you do have is when you cross a spiral arm, and we cross a spiral arm every couple hundred million years or so, even though we're more or less moving at half a million miles an hour, we're actually slowly catching up to our spiral arm. And we pass through it at a relative speed of maybe 50,000 miles an hour or so we go through it. And we go from an underdense region to something which is 10 times denser at a fairly high speed. So you get a little short, sharp, not a wind, but it's kind of a gravitational shock, which, which just shakes the thing a little bit. It happens more regularly as you move out in the Milky Way or when you move into the inner part of the Milky Way. And so it, it, doesn't bother, it doesn't affect us. Our little planets that sit down in the middle of our solar system, this gravitational shock doesn't do anything. We're blissfully unaware of it. But what you do have to worry about is this Oort cloud that surrounds the solar system. There's trillions of comets that are sitting out there that are loosely held onto our solar system. And every once in a while, when you give a short, sharp gravitational shock, it can be a spiral arm in this case, it will shake loose some of the comets. Some of them will escape completely away from the solar system but some of them will come raining down to the inner part of the solar system. And again, this has been postulated as one of the things that you're actually seeing around Tabi star, Boyajin star, is something has shaken loose a whole lot of comets and had them come raining down into the inner part. And this sort of thing does happen. The vast majority of them miss us. They happily go by us and don't have any impact on us, but some of them do hit us. And they are responsible probably for half dozen mass extinction events over the last sort of billion years or so. Now, we're still here, so not every one of these large events obviously has wiped everything out. Now, if you ask the dinosaurs, they would say they were not a good thing. And something like, at each, each one of these events, something between 80 and 90% of the species on Earth were wiped out at that point in time. So again, we've, we have navigated our way through this. They do happen, and they happen on a sort of, you know, time scales of tens, hundreds of millions of years, and it will happen again. Um, it's not really a whole, well, we'll have, you know, Elon Musk will probably save us somehow, or, <laughs> I don't know, Bruce Willis will, will go up and deflect the whatever comes in. But these things do happen. Um, and, you know, we can only go, you go back to, what, 25 years ago when it's not just us. Uh, this is Comet Shoemaker-Levy crashing into, into the Jupiter, Jupiter and breaking up in the upper atmosphere. Now, things like Jupiter, things like super-Earths that we don't have are actually thought to be a valuable shield by hoovering up gravitationally these comets that do come raining into the inner part of the solar system. So having those larger outer planets and super-Earths are thought to be a protective barrier. Now, the, sort of the last science thing before I wrap up is, and it's for me one of the most interesting science things that I've stumbled across over the last couple of years, uh, now, the European Space Agency has a beautiful satellite up launch right now called Gaia. Now, Gaia is st studying billions of stars around the Milky Way. And what it's able to do is, because it, the precision that it works with, it can figure out the position in three coordinates. So think of space as X, Y, and Z. So it's able to get the X, Y, and Z for billions of stars. But not only that, it can figure out how fast it's moving in the X, Y, and Z direction. So there's this sort of six dimensions of, of information. What that allows you to do is because you know where all these stars are moving, you can wind the clock forward to see where they're going, or you can wind the clock backwards to see where they've been. And 
the further you wind the clock forward or back, the, the more the predictive power disappears. But over periods of winding the clock forward 10 or 15 million years, you can actually track incredibly well how close stars will get to, to us. So what you, this is showing the closest approach for maybe 100 stars or so. So this distance here is around you know, the distance of, say, Alpha Centauri, plus or minus. So over this sort of 20 million year window, there aren't any stars getting closer to us than sort of where Alpha and Proxima Centauri are right now. But those with a good eye who aren't colorblind will see this green circle right here. So in one million years from now, this star, Gliese 710, so it's about half the mass of the sun, is actually going to go passing right through our solar system. Now, it's not going to get as close as the planets. It's going to be going right through the inner part of the Oort cloud. So it's about 4,000 AU away. Outside of the sun will be the brightest thing in the sky. It'll be observable during the day. Um, it's not going to affect the planets again, and its, it's radiation is not going to you know, evaporate our biosphere or anything like that. But this is a big, heavy thing passing slowly through this, these trillions of comets. It is going to shake comets loose like crazy. Many of them will escape. But the best guess is on the, in the ballpark, something like every month for about two to three million years, a naked eye comet will appear in the sky. So if you're an observational astronomer who's around in a million years, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. The sky is going to be lit up with comets. It's going to be like Halley's comets on steroids all over the place. Now, again, all it takes is for one of those comets to actually hit us, though. But it's going to be a spectacular time, regardless. It's also going to be the, the fastest moving thing in the sky. So for those, uh, it, it will be moving about a half an arc second a day. So that's roughly about 10 arc seconds in a month or so. So it'll do sort of half of the width of, the, um, of a full moon in every month. So it'll be a, a, the fastest, one of the fastest moving things in, in the sky as well. So this, probably most of us won't be around. Um, but this is something that's going to happen. There's, there's, you know, there's not much you can do about it. You're not going to be deflecting a, a, a star away from, from reaching us. And it's going to pass right through the Oort cloud. So that will be very, very exciting. So the last thing about these uh, stars, as you pass through the spiral arm, all of the young stars, the star formation in our galaxy are in, in spiral arms. And big stars, the ones that are 8, 10, 20, 50 times the mass of our sun, I said before, they live fast, they die young. And they explode spectacularly as supernova. This is sort of a supernova remnant, which is about 30 light years across filled with hot X-ray emitting plasma and a shock wave that's propagating outwards. And the amount of energy that's involved in every one of these supernova, so roughly one every 10 years goes off in our Milky Way. There's been a billion of them over the, the lifetime of the Milky Way. The amount of energy is the equivalent of a billion, billion, billion of the most powerful nuclear weapons on Earth, the SAR bomb. So there's an enormous amount of energy. And much like a nuclear weapon, if it explodes on the other side of the Earth, you're blissfully unaware of it here. If it explodes in Boulder, you're going to be aware of it here in Denver. And it's the same thing with one of these supernova. If it explodes on the other side of the galaxy, fine. It's all, everything you see around you today more or less came from a supernova anyways. So these things are important for building blocks of life. And they're important energy contributors. Uh, but if one explodes close to you, it's not good, as this energy, the shock wave, washes across you. There's, again, a hot debate in the literature in our community about how close can you actually be before a supernova blast wave will evaporate your biosphere. It's called the, the lethal radius of a supernova. Uh, the best guess nowadays is about 30 light years. So if, we, if the Earth had been sitting about here when this supernova went off, you know, broadly speaking, that would have been enough to evaporate our biosphere. Now, 10 million years ago, this is what happened. We were actually here. We were about 100 light years away from one of these supernovae that exploded. So by the time the, the wave reached us, it had dissipated enough energy that it didn't wipe us out. What it did do is it coated the Earth with all kinds of weird and wonderful radioactive isotopes that only are synthesized in supernova. So we don't know which star exploded, because it's gone now, but we know a supernova exploded. We know it washed over us. It left a nice thin layer of a weird isotope of iron, iron-60, which is radioactive. 
and it covers the Earth. And we know that this, this happened, and there's other radioactive isotopes as well. So these things, again, they do happen. We're still here, so clearly not every one of them wipes you out. But it just shows how fragile and tenuous things are. We were, we were within sort of a factor of three or five or ten or whatever the lethal radius zone is of a supernova not that long ago when, we, when we're talking about geological timescales. So again, these sorts of things do happen. And on top of everything else, if you talk, again, thinking about what we talked about, starting at what we talked about at the beginning, life, how common is it? Well, in 500 million years from now, the sun will be a little bit hotter. So forget about the, the effects of, you know, that we're having on, on climate. The, just talking about the stellar evolution. In 500 million years, our sun will be 5% brighter. That's not a whole lot, but that 5% is enough to drive what we call a moist greenhouse effect. That, as that 5% will start evaporating the atmosphere, which will put vapor up into the atmosphere, which basically makes a blanket, which makes it warmer, and you get the sort of this runaway effect. And so in 500 million years, the temperature will, average temperature on the Earth, oh, I'm sorry, I'm working in centigrade, so it'll be about 50 degrees centigrade. So that's about as hot as it gets even in the middle of Abu Dhabi in the hottest part of the time of the day. So the, it'll be somewhere between 50 and 80 degrees centigrade. Basically, the water will have started to boil away. It's not going to be a habitable zone. Now, you might think you could move to the North Poles where the temperature will be sort of 40 or 50 degrees or so. Um, unfortunately, by that point, continental drift, all the continents will have piled up at the equator. So you'll, you'll have to have some sort of Kevin Costner water world thing going on <laughs> up there, or we'll have to be underground or under the water or something by that point in time. Or, of course, by then again, Elon Musk's brain or whatever in a jar will have moved uh, the Earth further away from the sun out to the orbit of Mars and we'll, we'll be okay and we'll just shift the habitable zone. Or most likely we'll have well, probably have wiped ourselves out by that point in time. So where to, just to, to end what I do at the University of Hull is I, I make use of these, the supercomputer that I showed you at the beginning to do fairly high resolution simulations of things that eventually settle down to look like our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, I, what I want to do is identify, you know, if I can design a simulation that looks like the Milky Way that takes into account all of the sources of the chemical elements that are important for the building blocks of life, um, try to walk through my simulation to see where can I avoid the damaging effect of exploding stars, where can I avoid getting regularly pummeled by spiral arms, can I make some statistical arguments as to how common, you know, at least the conditions that are conducive for complex biological life here, how common are they spread throughout, say, our galaxy as a whole. Uh, and so this is sort of work in progress. Um, the tools that I'm using in the simulation that I just showed you, so I stuck these uh, slides in, just to, to demonstrate, people who do astronomy degrees or physics degrees, only about 20% go on and do, say, what I've done, either become an academic or become a, a physicist. The other 80% go off and do something else. And that's, I guess, the value of the physics degree and why it's one of the most marketable and has the lowest employment rates, is that you do have a degree of flexibility in the skills that you leave with. So the tools that we use in those simulations, it's, it's, it's tracing how the gas flows. It uses something called smooth particle hydrodynamics, SPH. And SPH was invented by astronomers to basically do what Arthur Milne worked on back in the early part of the 20th century, was figure out how energy gets carried through stars. And so a group of astronomers in Cambridge in the 70s developed a technique that allowed you to track how gas and fluids move very accurately, precisely, quickly, what industry recognizes that you could do all kinds of other things. So this is it's a work that one of my students does at the, uh, he did an astrophysics degree, now works at the World Bank in the Natural Disasters Division, doing simulations like this. Uh, if you're designing artificial hearts and looking at the pump, the valve mechanism opening and closing, look at the turbulence of the blood as it passes through. If you're working on um, Erosion simulations, which is a big part of what we do at the University of Hull, based where we are on the coast, or avalanche simulations. Uh, if you're doing things like, I don't know, even fun things like urban planning, aerospace, automotive engineering, structural engineering, working out stresses and strains here on, a, on an oil rig. Or again, a big part of what we do at the university is working on renewable energy. And so we work with Siemens, one of the, the largest producers of these sort of wind turbine blades, 
All of these are using software packages invented by astronomers to figure out how energy gets carried through stars, but are now applied to all of these different things. So the, a lot of the work that I do with my interns who are coming in during the summer or summer students, it's getting used to using these sorts of software packages, obviously to do the things I'm interested in, which is the stuff up there, but thinking about what they're going to be doing three, four, five years down the road, and those other 80% are going to be going off into industry and doing other things, making sure that they can take those transferable skills and go into these sorts of, of, these sorts of areas. And the last thing I want to show you is what we're doing right now. This is a work with the Korea Institute for Advanced Study called the Horizon Run. So the sorts of simulations that I've shown you here that we're doing, which are basically fairly high resolution simulations of individual galaxies, they fit within one one hundredth of one of the pixels in here. So this group have the world leaders in doing extremely large simulations, but with really simple physics, without the, the SPH, the fluid dynamics. It's just gravity, nothing else. So what we've spent the last three years is mapping our software onto theirs so that we can do millions of galaxies simultaneously rather than just sort of one at a time. And for context, it's about 100 times larger than anything that's being done before. It's being driven by my now PhD student, Leah, who's, who's doing most of the work on this. Um, and it's been running for the last year, and it's taking about 250 million core hours for those who pay attention to these sorts of things. So there's the summary slide. So are we alone or not? So I started off with about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. And so those, that's where you're going to be looking for life. And then you might, like I say, maybe 10% are in the right mass range that they're going to live for the right period of time, they're not going to blow up too soon, and they're not going to be too cold that you have to be butted up right against them. So maybe you've got 1 in 10 stars that are the right sort. Um, maybe 1 in 10 are in the right place in the galaxy, not too close, not too far, not getting pummeled by supernova constantly if you're in the inner part of the galaxy, which is where most of the stars are. Uh, maybe there's some debate as to exactly how many stars have planets, but you can be generous and say 50% have planets. 10% um, might have rocky planets in the habitable zone. Again, we'll know more about this over the next 10 years. You know, well, we've got roughly one, 1 in 10 in our solar system, so we just use that as a, as a number. Maybe 1 in 10 of magnetic fields. Again, this is still something that we don't know the answer to. Um, maybe 1 in 10 have a stabilizing moon to give you that long-term climate stability. So when you put them all together and multiply these 10% by 10% by 10%, it takes you down to maybe half a million potential advanced civilizations. You, could, you probably have heard of things like the Drake Equation. You can play with this within the Drake Equation if you really wanted to. So that's kind of the using the optimistic numbers. But again, you, if you want to be more pessimistic and say, play around with, take more pessimistic numbers here, it can take you down very quickly to sort of 500 potential civilizations. Now, the fly in the ointment here, and the last thing I will say is complex Complex advanced civilizations that you want to communicate, you know, there's only one we know about. Uh, they probably take some time to develop. The big question in all of this, and if you play with the Drake equation, you will see there's a number, all of these terms I've just mentioned are all in this thing called the Drake equation. There's one term at the very end of the Drake equation, which is where all of the socio-politics politics sit. How long do you, does a civilization live before it wipes itself out? And so, for us, we've been able, you can, our civilization, you can think of it as, it's been around for about 100 years in the form of being uh, advanced enough to communicate. You know, our, our radio waves have been leaking out for, you know, the last however long you want. Uh, you know, people who are 50 light years away from us right now, if they've got really clever telescopes and software techniques that can sift through the noise, they can be watching Star Trek right now for the first time because those, those radio waves are actually now making it to them. It would be very tip difficult to pick them out, but in theory. Uh, but, you know, we've, you know, we've come close to wiping ourselves out in, in various, you know, cataclysmic World War III type of Cold War events. If, and, and we're not out of that w the woods. So if civilizations lived, say, for as little as 100 years in that advanced communicative sense, or let's be generous and say 
10,000 years. If that number was 10,000 years, I can tell you how many civilizations there would be in the Milky Way now, it would be zero. That's how important this, this the social political term is. It kind of makes all of the other stuff in this Drake equation more or less meaningless. Civilizations, unless they live for hundreds of thousands of years at least, then the numbers start to become greater than zero. So the depressing part of all of this is that if there is something advanced that we could communicate with, broadly speaking, civilizations have to learn to get past that desire you know, to potentially wipe yourself out. You need to be around for several hundred thousand years in a statistical sense to have at least a handful of civilizations out there today doesn't mean they weren't there in the past, but at least the ones um, that might be existing in our Milky Way today, that's the sort of lifetime that you need to live to actually find some civilization out there. Where do I think we're going to find it right now? Oh, so that's what I said, yeah. If you live for 20,000 years, then, uh, then there's one. That's how it works out. So that's a bit depressing. So despite all of that, I do want to believe. <laughs> I still do believe, and I think, though, I don't think we're going to find it out there. I think we're going to, if we're going to find it, it's going to be here, it's going to be in our solar system. It's going to be these ice plumes around Europa, uh, the, these water plumes, these geysers that erupt from the surface, uh, from beneath the ice surface of both Enceladus and Europa. The conditions in the water that lurks beneath these thick ice coatings, you know, they've got the right salinity, probably the right pressure, probably the right temperature. You know, you're not going to find Aquaman or piranhas down there, but maybe, maybe you find that sort of that microbial, microbacterial life. And their missions, Europa Clipper mission for one, that's basically going to fly through these plumes and just scoop up huge amounts of this water vapor and analyze it in the hopes that that's what we'll actually find. I think if you find some life there, then I become much more confident that there's life out there everywhere. It's not in sort of the complex, advanced way, if you like, of, of communicating with us but I'll feel a lot better about it if we can discover it there. So, thank you. We have a question up top. Professor, I really enjoyed your talk. I just want to tell you, uh, it was about 25 years ago, um, a year or two before Carl Sagan died, he was here at DU and he gave a talk that sort of corresponds to that last question you have. And the title of this talk was, Does Intelligent Life Exist on Earth? And <laughs> 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 basically, it, it was uh, probably not just because of the things you said. You know, even if there are societies out there, we're probably going to destroy ourselves before we have a chance mm -hmm. to talk to each other. I know, that's the depressing part. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Uh, I'd like to connect a couple of dots from the things that you said in different yep. parts of the talk here. Yep. Uh, so one part of the talk was about the habitable zone. Another part of the talk was about uh, how the sun is getting warmer and uh, uh, it'll be warm enough that we'll be out of that habitable zone. Yep. And another part you uh, were saying is the habitable zones are different around different stars and the, uh, and, and the last different amounts of time. But aren't Habitable zones actually something that move uh, as the uh, as the sun ages uh, as, as the sun ages and uh, goes along the main sequence and increases temperature. Yep, that's so. That's basically exactly what I'm saying. That is why in half a, half a billion years our habitable zone will have expanded because the sun is evolving. It'll it'll be more dramatic in five billion years time when we no longer have nuclear fusion in the core. And then he becomes a red giant. Now, we all know, you know where we sit. It that red giant is probably going to you know, reach where the Earth is sitting right now. So it's not going to be habitable. But you know, it, it, even with a red giant, you know, you could just move further away. So again, if, you, if you've got the planetary technology to move the, you can move the planet in lockstep with the evolution of the star. Now the time scales, you know, millions upon millions upon millions of years. So it doesn't happen instantly. But that is, an individual star's habitable zone will evolve with time. Now we're at a very stable point in the evolution of our star, which is why it's not going to change much for a half a billion years or so, but it does evolve with time. It's it partly why 
you know, the, very, the first few hundred million years of the solar system where things are settling down. You know, things, things are not conducive for the development of life, um, but for different reasons. I mean, once the sun becomes stable, it's, it is more or less stable for a long period of time. Um, but we're now at a phase halfway through its lifetime where if you plotted the luminosity of the sun over the last few billion years, yeah, it's going up, but it's in the models, the solar models that sort of exist now, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating it, but in half, half a billion years, this thing will, will start to take off. So the habitable zone is shifting, but it's partly also the, the effect that it has on our atmosphere. So it's, it's not 100% a solar effect, it's the co combination of the sun being 5% hotter and the fact that we have a lot of water on the surface and a rich atmosphere that drives this greenhouse effect. So uh, if you took our Earth as it stands, you would have to shift it out a bit further away. But if you have a slightly different planet, you may not have to move it quite as far inside of that habitable zone. So you've got, you've got the two effects at play here. And the effect on our planet would not, would not be as strong if we didn't have a whole lot of water sitting on the surface. Another question there? Kind of going in the opposite direction from us, how far out would a military radar signal or a powerful signal be detected at a practical level from us? Well, in our current technology, it would be very difficult. Um, you have a lot of stuff that you, those radio waves as they propagate outwards have to go through. You know, first off, it's just getting through the atmosphere. But then as you move through inter interplanetary space, uh, as, you, as you start moving into interstellar space, you get scintillation effects that distort the signal. And, and this is even thinking, this is ultimately what uh, I started talking about that Hawking Zuckerberg breakthrough initiatives, their, their plan to use these lasers, these gigawatt or terawatt lasers to, to fire at these meter sized solar sails and accelerate the, you know, these postage stamp sized things to tenth of the speed of light. The, the, big, it's not, the, the technology is not so much the detectors and the, and the solar sails, it's actually can you keep a laser beam collimated enough as it gets, you know, scintillation sort of dis disperses it long enough to actually get this thing accelerated up to the, to the right speed. So the, the same thing would affect, you know, military signals that are propagating or TV signal, anything that leaks their way through. It's the scintillation and sort of jumbling up of that and trying to pick that out of the, the background noise of the radio scintillation that's around us right now. I, I'm sure someone has worked out the signal, you know, given roughly what the background radio noise is and how much radio waves have you know, propagated over the last 50 years. By the time you reach, you know, five light years, 50 light years, what fraction of the, say, the those photons that carry that energy that break those radio waves. I don't know what the number. In fact, I should know this answer, but it's. In fact, I will look it up. But it's you know it could be like for every for every one of those radio photons carrying that bit of information, there could be like a billion photons or more of background astronomical radio emission. So you have to have some really clever way that sifted through the, the signal to noise ratio would just be horrific to try to pick that information out to the level that I don't think we would have the ability to do that, unless it was something that was collimated and directed towards us, which is what the, you know, the belief is with these SETI searches, that you're not just eavesdropping on leaking noise, but someone's actually trying, you know, it's got some lighthouse effect and we're swinging it around, and that's how you get to pick it up. Then it becomes a little bit easier to pick out those signals because somebody's made a concerted effort to overcome the background radio noise. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, are uh, are K stars probably our, our best bet for? Are they the right balance? So, uh, or are we going to find that they're they have a so what I, secret? Yeah. Like so what I what I've been reading is that it's the I guess I'm sorry, the the early K stars are good, and the late K stars you're starting to get a bit too cool uh, temperature wise, and so the worry about how active the surfaces are become problematic. So it's the debate that I've seen is somewhere in that, at where the divide is, I'm not entirely sure, but it, 
I've heard numbers of you know, stars that range between sort of 0.7 to 1.5 solar masses is kind of the sweet spot um, for some of the reasons that I mentioned there. So you're getting into those early Ks when you get down to the 0.7 or so, uh, but the later K1s become more problematic. Right? So this is kind of a question and a comment. It seems to me that our knowledge and our science is trapped in an infinitesimally small segment of time. Uh, we've only been able to look at this stuff for, what, 10, 15, 20 years? Can you imagine what we might know 100 years out? Would you speculate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the lifetime, looking at, say, the next, the exciting things on the, on the horizon for me um, are things like TESS, which is going, you know, NASA's TESS mission, which is like the Kepler mission on steroids. So you'll have an enormous, a, a lot more information there that will allow you to make some, at least some statistical arguments. Um, that are a lot more robust than sort of the roving ones that, are, that, that I did there based on sort of like the Kepler information. Uh, I think the, the next generation of things like possibly the next James Webb Space Telescope or whatever goes up um, <laughs> you know, provide some, some interesting insights. Um, the ground based, the next generation, sort of the 30 meter class telescopes, are really big extremely large telescopes afford you the potential opportunity to, to start imaging maybe some in some sense and getting a little bit more information about planetary disks um, in a way that we're just hinting at now. You, we, can, we can start to probe some atmospheres of planets when they pass in front of stars and you can, this is work that you know, people at HAO have done here in, in Boulder and in NCAR looking at the absorption of starlight as it goes through an atmosphere and you can find these sodium rich atmospheres for example because you get these strong sodium lines that appear but you're just sort of scratching the surface of that with technology that exists right now i think sort of in our lifetime that's sort of 20 30 years i think you'll start getting spectra of the atmospheres of, of planets far more rich and detailed you'll start to find oxygen rich maybe you'll start to do things like get People have speculated that the next generation of 30, 40, 50 meter class telescopes will be able to map the, uh, for example, if there's foliage by looking at signals of, of chlorophyll, or, but of course that assumes that it's a chlorophyll based plant life, uh, but also by looking at, say, how the, the brightness, the albedo changes of planets as a function of time. Do you see the appearance of plant life coming and going? Do you see seasons based off of reflectivity? And things? So I, I think. This is sort of speculative, but I think you will, over the next 30, 40, 50 years, okay, you can start to speculate, you know, way beyond that, but then it's just left to your wild imagination. But I think over that time scale, we'll start to see things like that and actually be able to pinpoint down whether there is foliage or seasons occurring. And I, I think that'll be very exciting. It's a, it's a small step, but it's something that is coming on that sort of time. Great answer. Yeah. Um, I did see one other question. Uh, yeah, you, and you're going to be the last. All right. Uh, <laughs> so kind of, uh, you, you brought up the slide with interesting UFO videos on YouTube and meteors. Um, in 2017, we detected uh, the Moomoo, the Moomoo, the Moomoo, uh, interstellar object. Yep. Uh, Professor Lowe at Harvard was quoted making some interesting potential ideas for where its origin might be. I'd be interested in your take. <laughs> uh, I think these things are very common. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface. We'll, we'll find many more of them, particularly there's a large telescope, a large optic survey telescope, uh, which is surveying the entire sky you know, every night down in an unbelievable depth. We are going to find many more of these things. Um, they are disrespect to Apollo, but he's completely wrong. Uh, there is not some sort of alien vessel that is coming through. Um, these things are common. They are things that 
can do you know exactly what I just said a sec, you know the, about shaking up the Oort cloud and shaking up stellar systems. This happens all the time. We're, we're not unique. There are other areas near us where this occurs as well. Either a star passing by another star, what we call a big molecular cloud passing by another star. It shakes things loose. Material gets shaken loose. When it gets shaken loose, it goes out at sort of the escape velocity of that thing. So while we're not surrounded by gazillions of them raining down on us, we're going to find more of these things. They're, they're not going to be wildly uncommon. Um, and they're not, it's not shocking that we find them. It's just exciting that it's the first one. I just don't believe for a second that it has anything to do with the alien structure. As cool as it would be. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.